My name is Clancy Immerslin, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm very glad to be here this morning, safe and sane and sober, as I like to say, because I didn't used to be, and I may not be again someday, because uh, the streets are full of people who used to be safe and sane and sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, and somehow forgot why they were here. And it's a funny thing, when you remember that you are vulnerable, you will keep doing the things that will keep you sober. If you start thinking you are invulnerable, there's no reason to keep doing them, and sometimes you find you're very vulnerable. That's rather convoluted logic, but I understand it. <laughs> I feel, uh, I feel rather humble this morning. I prevailed upon, well, <laughs> that's a relative thing. <laughs> I, uh, might seem arrogant to newcomers, but... <laughs> but I prevailed upon my wife to come and hear me talk this morning. She, she comes about every eight or nine years to hear me talk. <laughs> and... Uh, she wasn't going to come this morning, but I told her I'd get her a free ticket to the Al-Anon luncheon. So. She's always told me that she hears enough around the house. She doesn't want to hear any more on the road. So. But I'm glad she's here. I'm glad there are a number of people here. And I think I want to thank the committee for inviting me to speak. There's something vaguely obscene about giving an AA talk at 10 o'clock in the morning. My heart doesn't start till 11. But uh, I'm glad I'm here. I very much enjoyed the meeting last night. If those of you who were not here, if those of you who were here heard it, Bob P., our uh, general manager of the AA World Services New York, who I have been present, I guess, during most of the regimes of the AA World Service general managers, and he, in my opinion, has the greatest ability to reconcile dissident factions of anyone I've ever seen. He really does a remarkable job. You think it's tough in the central offices where there's only a couple thousand people calling every day complaining. In New York, it's just a barrage of things going on. And I have always uh, admired and respected his ability to, to do that. I, uh, I would hope that another 10 or 15 years I will develop that. But the moment, I, I haven't. I believe what I believe, and anyone who doesn't believe that way is suspect. <laughs> and there's a room full of suspect people here this morning, I'll tell you that. We have a group of folks here from Little Rock, Arkansas, who are visiting. The, one of them is legitimate. He's our spiritual speaker on Sunday morning. The rest are just They'd just like to see what big cities are like and have a little fun and get used to walking on sidewalks. Although it is hard, they're getting blisters on the on their toes. I used to uh, I used to drink alcohol. Now that takes care of the AA part of the talk. No, like I had a uh, kind of a touching weekend last weekend. I, uh, I was up in Minneapolis talking at a meeting Saturday night, and I went over and spent mo Sunday and Monday with my parents in uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, the little town I come from. And they're both old and feeble, and neither one of them are going to get better again. And, and it's, it makes me kind of sad, and I was thinking about that as I went from one who is feeble and get to the rest home to see the other who is feeble and they can't, they can't, are not to terribly coherent, they get coherent and incoherent. That's a very touching thing to see amongst people who, who have been strength figures. And I was thinking about my sponsor who is very ill now at the same time and is kind of not the dynamic man most of us have known him to be. 
And I had kind of a Tuesday morning, I had to get up about 5 o'clock to drive 100 miles through a snowstorm to get on a plane in Minneapolis to go back to Los Angeles to go to work. And I was driving along in the snow, and I was the only one on the road. And, and I had a terrible wave of sadness come over me, as though all of the things I have relied on are going down around me, and what will I do? And I know that that's just an emotional, fatigue-ridden thing, because I will... Uh, that's the nature of life. We will all, as I have said before, we have, as the columns who have held up our own individual roofs go down as they must, then we become the columns for the people behind us until we go down and they will become the columns and so forth. <clears throat> and it was, it was strange because it's been something over a quarter of a century now since I've had a drink or since I've really felt it's been a long time since I felt terribly dependent on anything except Alcoholics Anonymous. But it's an indicative of that inside of all of us, I think inside probably of all people, but I would assume of all alcoholics, there's a, there's a small boy or girl who sometimes when the right buttons are pushed looks out at the world and says, who is going to take care of me? I was thinking of that this morning. I woke up in my room and I was lying in bed, and I was thinking, I have, a, I have a granddaughter in high school. And it suddenly grabbed me, what am I doing with a granddaughter in high school? <laughs> you know. Because I, this morning I felt like somehow or other, I was about 20, and I had been burdened with an old body. <laughs> my mind said, leap up, and my body said, no way. <laughs> and it continues to remind me of the basic conflict that goes on in me, and I presume all people like me. We have come here, we have been exposed and hopefully trained in a program of recovery that gives us goals to achieve and goals of superior stability, at least in most areas of the world, of some emotional solidity. And coupled with all of these wonderful things we are trying to achieve, we are trapped inside of a very human person. And it has been said many times, no matter how hard you work the program, you never rise above human beings. And human beings are not always fun to be in. <laughs> They're capable of great wonderfulnesses, followed immediately by petty little crap. <laughs> uh, just, and you just, all the information comes out of one hole, and it's hard to tell which is the chocolate ice cream some days. You just, that isn't it. Uh, <clears throat> and we are. I think that is the great problem and the paradox of all of us. We live in a world of fine, in a society of fine ideals, and each of us are in our own way short of those ideals. I think what's one of the great things I was read this morning, it's a good thing to remember, because sometimes we get caught so caught up in the verbosity of the podium or in the discussion group where sometimes people get progressively more perfect as you go around the table. <laughs> Sometimes the one who's going to speak last can't wait. He rushes off to be lifted bodily to his heavenly home. <laughs> I was thinking of that last night. Uh, I was at a, stopped in a marathon meeting to, to judge the quality of the visitors. <laughs> And a young man I know from Dallas was the first speaker at the 6 o'clock marathon. And he came up and gave a great talk about AA and how glad he was to be here. And as he got up the podium, people clapped. He kept walking right out the door and right back to his room, I guess, to look in his mirror to see how it really was. <laughs> the, uh... But we... All of us, it seems to me, 
have to be very careful that we do not get trapped in an image. Probably there's nothing more deadly that I know of that is more critical for people who have been sober longer than 20 minutes. And that is to keep from falling into that image that I must look good at all times, and if I don't, I will withdraw. I have discovered one of the great truisms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that is this. Making mistakes does not make you drunk. True story. Making mistakes does not make you drunk. If making mistakes made you drunk, we'd all be drunk. Making mistakes, you could do some terrible things in AA. I remember I was sponsoring a guy a few years ago, and he was doing pretty well. He just got custody of his children, just elected secretary of a group. He was having some difficulty in his job, but, you know, a lot of people do that. And I got a call one day from the FBI. They gave the guys in. They said, are you his sponsor? And I said, yes. He said, uh, we just arrested him for bank robbery. <laughs> And I said, bank robbery? You must have the wrong man. This man's a spiritual man. I said, uh, well, he was most of the day, I guess. Just, he, got, he got pushed into a corner a little bit. and uh, So I talked to him. You know, I always said one thing about this guy. He always did everything I told him. He always did. There was never any argument. And I... He pointed out to me, and I thought of it later. I never had told him not to rob banks. I just, you know, he thought I gave him a little latitude in that area. The odd thing was, he was holding up this bank to get money to fix his car so he could support his children. And unfortunately, after he'd robbed the bank and came outside, he couldn't get his car started. <laughs> And so the guard came out and put a 45 in his ear and said, that's all, you know. So they sentenced him to the federal penitentiary at Terminal Island. But to show you what the virtue of a good training will do, he became secretary of that group down there, by God. <laughs> and did a wonderful job. When he came out, he uh, has lived soberly ever since. Now you would think robbing banks might not be conducive to top-notch sobriety. <laughs> and it isn't. It really isn't. It doesn't make you terribly comfortable, but you can stay sober. You can stay sober through anything. The problem, if you really are desperate and if you have a high pain threshold, the problem is how to get sober and comfortable. And that's what the rest of it is about. And you come to understand making mistakes does not make you drunk. Defending mistakes can make you drunk. When you have to prove that it isn't the way it is, and you have to start a tissue of fabrication and fantasy to enable you to keep your image that it really isn't the way it is, it's the this way. And pretty soon you get back to that old fantasy Bob was talking about last night. This un where this it's hard to tell what's real and what isn't real. And it's very, very difficult to do that because you, the world is different somehow and other people don't see it that way. It's almost a, like a temporary psychosis you go into. You live in a world that nobody else can see. And then you are pushed into the corner and pretty soon the desperations come back and pretty soon you're gone. I live most of my life in that sort of way. I lived most of my life drifting in and out of fantasy situations that I could believe but no one else could see. That it isn't really the way you see it, it's this way. And people said, no it isn't. And then I could feel persecuted. You don't understand. I suppose, you know, a few years ago, in the late 1950s, the only major study of alcoholism that I know of, a really major study of alcoholism, except for the incidental scientist who discovers that alcoholics can drink again. <laughs> it's interesting thing you see in the Times, was it Thursday morning? Two, two more scientists had discovered alcoholics could drink, and uh, the survivors of his test 
are suing him for, what, $11 million? <laughs> if they can get their counselor to file the papers. <laughs> but the only major study of alcoholism I've ever known of that's really a big one, and that is the one that was held at Yale University in the late 1950s, the Yale Institute of Alcoholic mm -hmm. Studies, it was called. And they studied alcoholics from all over. They studied different psychological backgrounds and sociological backgrounds and intelligences. And they took psychological profiles and they took everything. And they had tests that give known alcoholics alcohol and known non-alcoholics the same amount of alcohol and see if they could determine some kind of a difference between them and why they acted differently. And uh, I've often thought about that. That would have been fun to be in that test of the day they offered two drinks in their test. You know, here's, here's your second drink. Thank you. Well, that's all the test for today. <laughs> but they, they only came up with two things that seemed to be rather unified amongst all the people they tested. One. All of the known alcoholics, for some reason they could not identify, ranked extremely high on the perfectionism area of their psychological profile. The other one was that they could not understand, and most people can't understand it today, the known alcoholics reacted differently to the same amount of alcohol that the non-alcoholics reacted to. Didn't mean they ran, ran crazy or run through the streets nude or anything. They just seem to have a different reaction. They, they almost look different. And I'll tell you, anyone that's ever worked with alcoholics very long or sponsored people for a long time, I'll tell you something. You can literally see that. You can look at a person and tell if he's had two drinks. You don't have to smell his breath. There literally is a personality change. They're literally, they're, their face looks different. You just, you say, that guy's been drinking. That, so, you know, it's the same facility that sponsors get that I used to just hate, where they can hear one drink over the telephone. It just makes you, <laughs> makes you crazy. You know, you've been drinking? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. You old son of a bitch. I'm not going to talk to you. But there's one other thing, I suppose, they have no way of testing this that I don't suppose at that Yale Institute, but I thought about it, I've thought about it over the years. The other thing that possibly, the other thing that possibly they could have identified everyone having there, but they'd have no way to test for it, except to the individual reaction. The other third factor that I have ever seen, I'm sure you have seen too, that's present in all alcoholics, known alcoholics, practicing alcoholics, and often sober alcoholics. And that is a deep-seated, absolute knowledge that my case is different than yours. Now that sounds kind of funny, but that kills over 90% of people like you and me. And a lot of them have been in AA. And they've come here and said, yes, but my case is different. I see them almost every day down on Skid Row. I don't suppose there's ever been a week gone by that I haven't seen people who I used to know in Alcoholics Anonymous who were apparently doing a little better but got trapped into that, but my case is different. And they hide behind their image. Everything is all right, but deep in their heart they know they don't understand. And I think that's the most deadly aspect of this disease. The inability to understand the nature of the illness, it very nearly killed me. It killed me once, almost killed me again, left me for dead on the streets, and at the end of all my years of drinking, all the years of being in jail, all the years of being committed to the insane asylum, by someone who's here in the room, <laughs> We occasionally get we occasionally get letters in the mail unsigned with amounts of money in the envelope saying, Charlotte, 
do it again, do it again. <laughs> I suspect they're from people who I've just told to take their fourth step. But losing everything, losing my family, losing my occupation, losing my home eventually, eventually losing my front teeth. You know, you can get new families, you can you get new homes, and you can get new occupations. But when you've lost your front teeth, that's, that's like our book says in chapter 3. We are like men who have lost their front teeth. We never grow new. Or whatever it says, I don't know. I... I just read the 24-hour-a-day book. I... <laughs> and the last day of my drinking, as I stood on Skid Row in Los Angeles, weighing maybe 108 pounds, and a T-shirt, an old pair of pants, and some tennies, and sick and desperate, and I stood there and thought, all the things, remember just, had been two or three years before that, I directed a grand opera at the University of Texas at El Paso. I had uh, won awards for my writing. I had done tremendous things. I had made great surges. And here I stood, and I had just been thrown out, 86th out of the Midnight Mission, as not being up to their standards. <laughs> and I tried to explain to this guy, hey, listen here. <clears throat> but I was having a little difficulty with my consonants at that time. There are some, I want to do what a World Service General Manager does. There's a whole bunch of seats over here if you get tired of standing. If you just want to be proposed to leave, I don't... But there are a bunch of... There are about 15 seats over here if you want to sit down. We have a couple here in the loge. But as I stood on that street, if a man were to come by and said, put a lie detector on me and said, are you an alcoholic? I would have said, no, I'm not. And that needle wouldn't have quivered because I had been going to AA off and on for nine years by that time. I had been in psychoanalysis. I had been in metaphysics. I had read all sorts of books. And I knew one thing, based on all of these things, somehow, my case was different, and I could not identify how. And I used to think, maybe there's been a genetic follow-up. Maybe I should have been born in a different century or a different country or a, with a different background or something. But something that's just... A guy in our group years ago had a good way to describe that. He always said he went through most of his life with a certain knowledge that sooner or later a spaceship would land behind him, a door would open, and a voice would say... It is time to go home now. <laughs> He's kind of a reverse Superman. He came to Krypton where they were superior. We, I came from Inferiorville where there was an uphill battle all the way. And I knew my problem was not alcohol. My problem were the emotions and my abilities to perceive the injustices and my ability to see that the world was jam-packed full of crapheads. <laughs> and that if I only would have found the place I fit, I would have been something. Because I was almost something time after time after time. That place where I directed an opera. I, uh, a year before that, I was playing piano in a whorehouse in San Francisco. Now... That's kind of a quantum leap to respectability. <laughs> I, uh, I ran into a guy I'd been in the Navy with, and we hitchhiked. We hitchhiked to uh, Texas, and I started off at a little job, and a year and a half later, I brought my family in where they'd been waiting patiently on a frozen farm in Wisconsin. They were always a town or two behind. <laughs> None of our children ever ran away, but Daddy was gone a lot. <laughs> in fact, when they were reading Chapter 3 this morning, I, it's a funny thing that in there it talks about, it didn't get to that part where they, when they read it, but the things people like us do when the heat is on, like changing from scotch to brandy and drinking beer only or 
drinking only at work or not drinking at work or taking a trip or not taking a trip or swearing off with or without a solemn oath or reading spiritual literature. It goes on and on. I read that a few years ago and I had to laugh. I had tried everything in there except one. I never tried not taking a trip. <laughs> when the, uh, it's always been my experience that people who stay and face the consequences of their actions are hiding something. <laughs> they, but I hitchhiked in there, I got a little job. A year and a half later, Charlotte was there, the children were there. I was working days at an advertising agency. At night, I was directing this opera. I was doing some writing for the local newspaper and really making full speed. And then it started to go out, go again. And a few months later, I was a suicide in our garage. And after that, I was in the insane asylum for an indefinite period. And after that, I was on electric shock treatment that were guaranteed to wipe out my head for the rest of my life. Now, those kind of things, they tell me that I've got ability if I can only find the place where people didn't turn bad after a while. <laughs> if I could just find the place where people didn't turn bad. The best analogy I think about that, a couple a few years ago I was talking up in Portland and these people were talking about how they'd experienced the Mount St. Helens explosion and they're, they all had the same reaction to it. You know, they, when this thing exploded, a bunch of lava didn't come down the hill and eat them but there's a fine dust that settled on everything. It just settled on everything. And they were just, day by day, you didn't hardly notice it, except day by day your lawn got grayer, and the house got grayer, and the car got grayer, and the children got grayer. And this, one guy said, I had a laugh, he said, I stood up in my front yard, and I said, stop it! <laughs> Which is as good a way as any, I guess. But he, I was thinking about that on the plane on the way home. That is the story of my life. Time after time I have found the, the place, the people, the job, the new situation. I bring my wife and children in. It's going to be all right here. And then some invisible celestial Mount St. Helens blows up somewhere. And one day that old job starts to look gray. And the house looks gray. And the car looks gray. And the crap heads in this town look gray. And little by little, it grays down. And you just pretty soon think, what? What's going on here? What did I ever see in this stinking place? And you get trapped. And if you are like me, you may have made a breakthrough. I suppose you did. A few drinks adds a little color anyway. And you try to drink to add a little color while you decide what to do next. And then sometimes it gets so gray you drink more than you should. And you may get drunky poo. And then well-meaning people want to talk to you for your own good. <laughs> and they all say different things, but they all have one thing in common. They all have little thin blue lips. Now this is for your own good. <laughs> Sometimes they say things like, don't you think your children would be heart sick to see you in this condition? <laughs> and some of them say things like, how do you expect to stay part of the corporate team if you're going to act so bizarrely? or the one that everybody's heard, but you have such potential. <laughs> when you start hearing that, you know two things. I'm in trouble because I have to simulate interest in this. And secondly, they don't understand. You can go back to AMA, made up of well-meaning nincompoops, who have no real understanding. Remember once when I was just about before I went off the insane asylum, I went to an A meeting, I thought, I'm gonna just once test them, let them know how bad it really is. I sat there, I said, I don't know if you understand this. I think I'm going crazy. And this one 
nice man leaned over and said, Son, you keep coming back. <laughs> and I deduced that he did not understand the nature of my problem. That does, that's no answer at all. Keep coming back. I won't be around to come back, you boob. <laughs> I've got a bunch of hot checks out. If I don't cover them by Monday, they'll garnish my wages. I'll go to jail. What'll I do? Well, you turn it over to your higher power. I tried that once, and my higher power turned them over to Sheriff Peter Pitches. I knew one thing, my web was too tangled for the well-meaning but simple ministrations of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's why I tried these other things. I went to psychoanalysis. I discovered I'd been deprived as a youth. I never knew that. It used to plunge me in depressions from time to time. Remember one day the psychiatrist saying to me, this was years later, said, you mean to say, Mr. Emerson, in 1935 you didn't have a bicycle? And I said, no, but I got thinking about it on the way home. <laughs> and for a month or two, every time I wanted to whip myself into a frenzy of sorrow, I just had a, I could create a picture, a little tousled haired, apple cheeked, blue eyed little tyke on the streets of Eau Claire, Wisconsin watching his little friends ride their bicycles back. <laughs> Don't worry about me, I'll go into psychoanalysis later. <laughs> Took me almost two months to remember, nobody in Eau Claire, Wisconsin had a bicycle in 1935. <laughs> One kid did, we thought he was a freak, we beat him up and broke his bicycle. But for people like me, psychoanalysis has a tendency to kind of fertilize your paranoia. It just... <laughs> the more you learn, the more you realize you've been screwed all along. It's just no end to it. It's just endless. It's an old analogy, but it's one I always liked. For people like me, not for real people, but for people like me, Going into psychoanalysis and learning all these things is very similar. You get to know so much about things that it completely blinds you to the fact you're not getting any better. But you just, you know why, anyway. It's like being on the deck of the Titanic and hitting an iceberg and the ship goes down and everybody else rows away as fast as they can. And people like me stand on the deck and say... I'm not getting off this baby till I find out why this happened. <laughs> and uh, the sad thing is you may find out why, but you, I know why. <laughs> but, uh, It takes a while to come to understand, if you survive long enough, to discover knowing why is of no value at all, unless you have a way to get off your own personal sinking ship. Knowing why you're going down is absolutely pointless. That's why we have a different therapeutic here, once you can stay long enough to find it out. But I tried a lot of things, and I was in and out had problems, tried to find the right answer, but one thing I knew, my case is different. And there's no sense trying to explain it to anyone because they don't understand. There's one thing for sure people around this, here don't understand. In other words, when I, I don't mean here in the Sheraton Universal, I mean whatever town I was in. They don't understand. Maybe you have had just noticed this phenomenon as you get more and more distraught you have to call longer and longer distances in the night. You, I'm going to call that girl I met in Rome. I wonder if she's still there. There's no one around here. 
Long distance calls are indigenous to crazy people because there's nobody around here who understands. Maybe they do in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And it, it just seems to be so dreadful. A lot of people like me try suicide and run and all sorts of things. And I could have gone to my grave and never would have known what's happened. Someone else said this once, but it's certainly true. I think about my suicide in Texas. And it's, I'm certainly glad it didn't succeed because I would, I would have killed the wrong man. I never would have known that a goof like me could have stayed sober and lived comfortably. But I almost died finding that out. And a lot of people do die. I see people dying every day who are no worse and no better than I have been. I see people moving into alcoholic insanity every day. You know, there's a funny thing about in AA. I'm going to take just a moment to mention that we talk about insanity a lot here. Then we use the, the term alcoholic insanity and then returning us to sanity. I want to say, if I may, those are two different things. Alcoholic insanity, we get the feeling a person with alcoholic insanity is someone who's acting goofy at the meetings or making crazy middle-of-the-night phone calls or just goofy. That is not alcoholic insanity. Alcoholic insanity is a physical condition. It is a physical condition. Returning us to sanity from the insanity of being drinkers, that's the emotional condition. Alcoholic insanity is physical condition. Alcohol is a drying out substance. That's why when you get up when you've been drinking at night, you sometimes have a fire in the morning that's burning because alcohol dehydrates cells as it dries. And it does this enough in the brain long enough, enough in the bloodstream, it dehydrates the brain cells. And if you dehydrate enough brain cells, you're gone because the brain cells never revive themselves. Only two major organs do not revive themselves, livers and brains, the two we need worst. <laughs> your arm, sure, your foot, but not your liver or your brain. But when an alcoholic my brain is dried out enough, they go into what's known as alcoholic insanity. We call it a wet brain. It's a dry brain. But you'll never see very few of those around the meetings, or you won't see them anywhere, because I'll tell you where those people are. They sit in chairs, and people come and change their diapers three times a day and feed them and put them to bed and get them up and feed them and change their diapers and they never ever ever can get better when you see that it just makes the hair on the back most of you've never seen a case of them I hope you never do I see them all the time they make me even to this day make me want to cry and uh, it's just almost the same thing as terminal, the last stages of syphilis, except syphilis at least has the decency to kill the patient. Alcoholic insanity will keep you alive 40 years in that condition. And you may come out once in a while. And that's sad if you do come out, because you come out and they say, what am I doing here? Where, where am I? I have a sponsor, a man whose wife is like that. And about one... And about once a year, she comes to and says, where's, where's Kenny? And he used to rush down there, but by the time he got there, she was back in. So she never didn't know who he was. And it was really sad. She's gonna, she'll be sitting there, she'll be sitting on that porch for 30 years if she keeps her health up. And it goes on and on. But I see people in alcoholic in Sandy. I see people dying of alcoholism. I see people dying in the secondary aspects of alcoholism. Oh, there isn't a week go by that there isn't somebody dead right around me, either sometimes from drinking, sometimes from stabbing, sometimes from a two-by-four with a nail in it through the brain, which happened last week, on and on. But that still would never have educated me because I'm not like them. My case is different. I have feelings that other people don't seem to have. I guess they have them, but they don't have them with the intensity I have them. I studied myself indefinitely. I thought I was the only one doing that. I didn't realize I lived in a world of people doing that. I studied myself indefinitely, a lot, to try to, as they say, sift things out. I studied myself so much that 
Probably the one, one of the more difficult steps I had to work at AA was the 11th step. I thought if I get meditating, it may be all over again. Just. But I came to the conclusion, my emotions were like other people's, except they were more intense. I am more easily frustrated by dummies than other people are. I am less tolerant of people who don't seem to do things and don't take an interest in things. I seem to have more anxiety than other people seem to have. I know they get anxious about things, but they... I get anxious about things, but I get anxious for things I can't even... I don't even know why I'm anxious. And that is really a drag, because you just... I remember sitting... I thought about this years ago. We had, when I got out of the nut house, we'd moved to Dallas, and I was working on some really big national things. And uh, you sit in that office and think, I've got such anxiety... And I don't dare tell anybody because they're all just simpletons. You know, they're anxious, but they say, I'm anxious about this. I think, what if my boss came through? What if, what if the head of that agency came through, as he sometimes did, and asked me how I was, and I told him the truth? He would puke. You know, he said, I don't do any Amazon. Oh, I'm afraid. <laughs> Well, what are you afraid of? Beat the shit out of me. I don't know. <laughs> Those are not the correct answers out there in the world. The correct answers are things like, How are you doing today? Just fine. <laughs> Just getting rid of some tired blood, Mr. Carlson. <laughs> we learned it. But you sit there and you simmer, and I, I had that. I fell into that syndrome and never even recognized it until after for years and years, until I was in sober a number of years. That terrible inferior, superior, inferior, superior, below you, above you, below you, above you, and the only one place that I never felt was equal to you. I'm below you, and I'll try to bring you down. I'll get above you and I'll have contempt for you. But I can't be equal without even being aware of it. And loneliness. I know a lot of people have loneliness. But I thought I was the only one in the world who seemed to be most lonely sometimes when I was with people. They get lonely because they're lonely, because they're alone. And we sometimes think that's so sad. Talk about, I'm alone. That isn't sad. It's kind of nice sitting there sometimes. It's a delicious agony. You sit there, and if you're a romantic like me, you play a record, have a little drink, sing along. I'll be seeing you. And it sounds sad, but it's delicious. It's, a, it's like building your own cross and just hanging for about two hours. One with this kind of something touching about it. the things that get you are when you're in the middle of crowds and you have this terrible feeling of discomfort and it takes almost retrospect to realize what you were feeling was loneliness loneliness with people different cut off and I discovered that alcohol overcame that I used alcohol I felt to assuage my feelings and sometimes got out of control, and sometimes I didn't care. But that's why it never was much of an incentive to me to have well-meaning people say, we will help you get sober, and everything will be all right. Because I knew it may be that way for alcoholics, but not for me, baby. And so I went to AA off and on. I tried all these therapeutics. I should say in all reality that psychiatric help was not a total not a total loss to me. I remember the morning I was in the Phoenix drunk tank and a guy had just kicked in my front teeth because he said I'd vomited on his bunk. And I was a uh, little sicky poo on the floor. I was so sick I couldn't even move my head. But I was almost able to I instantly identify his problem. <laughs> yeah. I remember thinking... This son of a bitch is overreacting. 
when you have insights like that, you don't mind the effort it took to get it. And I very nearly died on the street. And one morning I walked 71 blocks in a cold rain from Skid Row to where the AA club was on Wilshire and Fairfax and started to go in. And an old guy named Tom Jones says, you can't come in. I go, why? He said, you remember you're banned out of the AA club, the 60 year I said, banned? What for? He says, you remember you stole the coffee money at the coffee cup discussion group two weeks ago? So oh yeah, I remember that now, huh? I wasn't going to steal it. I was going to make amends to him later. I just needed something. And finally, uh, he finally let me in. I got in the back room. And I thought, I'll have to do the same thing here as I did to get out of that Texas nut house. I'll have to pretend to go along with their crap. I'll play their sick little game. Some of the greatest AA talks I ever heard came out of my mouth when I was a patient in that nut house in Texas. And they used to... They used to take me around to little towns to show the wonderful work AA was doing. I'd go to Midland and Odessa, San Angelo, and give them a friend. I'm just proud to be here tonight. On behalf of my fellow patients, thank each and every one of you for bringing my faith and hope. Those of us trapped in the vicious desert of alcoholism. We went across this tall, vast desert of alcoholism. In the distance, we saw the tall green hills of sobriety, and we came upon them, but they were too steep for our weary legs. <laughs> Folks such as you pointed out 12 golden stairs that we could use to climb the hill of sobriety. We now stand atop the hill of sobriety, and we want to go back to our homes throughout Texas and carry the message of hope that you've given to us. May God bless you in your wonderful work. <laughs> Old ladies used to cry in the audience. Isn't that beautiful, Betty? <laughs> you can laugh. Got me out of the Texas nut house. And the funny thing is, I never had another drink till I ran out of Thorazine. <laughs> they, uh... But I pretended to be an alcoholic. I said, I'll pretend to be an alcoholic here. And I pretended to be an alcoholic. And I, I didn't have any place to sleep that night. He finally let me. And he said, there's an old abandoned car down behind the signboard. You can sleep in there tonight. Okay. I thought that'd be a colorful part to tell the next time I was on top. And uh, I was in that car for months. I was just going to stay there until I could get a score. I never got the score. And I went to meetings all the time, and I ate cake in those meetings. I got so sick, of, some days that's all I had for days at a time was AA cake. You can't imagine what it's like to lie awake at night and dream about boiled potatoes and things like that. <laughs> and I, uh, occasionally some guy let me sleep on the sofa for a week or two. And I'd, I'd run my course then and they'd say, well, that's all now, you have to go now. Because I was, I had a bad attitude too. But I went to meetings all the time. I went to meetings. And I did these things. I got a, I always, town after town, Charlotte remembers, I had wonderful sponsors. The editor of the El Paso Times, a man named Jimmy Halloran, was my sponsor. The, a famous, well-known pediatrician in Dallas, Dr. John Ashby, was my sponsor there. I thought I'd kill two birds with one stone. Uh, he'd be my sponsor and he could take care of my kids free. That worked out. I always had sponsors who were nice guys. To me, the, the magic term was, I want to hear someone who says, I have unjudging love. That's my new sponsor. Because <laughs> unjudging love, non-judgmental love, if you're lucky, they won't judge you. Because there's nothing in the world worse than a nagging, judgmental sponsor. And I... What you do in a case like that, if you're new and planning on slipping a while, get a sponsor like that, get his name, preferably someone with a lot of prestige in the community, so when you come in to me and say, who's your sponsor? Dr. John. Oh. <laughs> Don't ever talk to Dr. John, but use his name lavishly. And about the only time you ever call him is about two in the morning, some morning. Hello, Fred. I'm afraid I've let you and AA down. Now, if you've got a sponsor, he'll say, you haven't let us down. 
You're a sick man. You've had a relapse. I'm coming right over it. I'll get some of the guys. I'll bring a pint so you won't go into DTs. You need some money? Let me know. I'll, we'll get you through this, Clance. It'll be all right. Now, that's what I call a sponsor. In California, I had sunk so low I couldn't get a quality sponsor. I got some guy who didn't know how to be a sponsor. He said things to me like, Kent, call me any time you want to. Night or day. If it's night, it better be important. Any time you want to. Up till the time you drink. And don't call after that, because all you're ever going to get is a click and a dial tone. I, I didn't say anything because I didn't want to hurt his feelings, but I felt, I was, you don't know nothing about sponsorship. <laughs> I, he'd explain, he'd tell me to do that. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I mean, like, well, Bob, I thought maybe I'd go, I don't care. I don't want to hear it. Just do it. He was crazy is what he was. I just did anything to get him off my back. I did. You're just hideous. I remember when I was six months sober, I'd lost my job as a dishwasher. And through it. At that time, I, I was perceiving things a little more clearly. And I was working at, this, at the uh, Gaiety Delicatessen on Sunset. Now there's a Thai restaurant there, because when they fired me, I put a double curse on them and put them out of business just 15 years later. But... I was washing these dishes, and it became obvious to me the busboys are bringing in more dishes than this restaurant is using. I could deduce from that they're getting them from other restaurants to humiliate me. So I just didn't know a lot of them. I said, do your own, do your own. And... Uh, Turned out I'd miscounted, so I got fired. And that day I was going to commit suicide. If, if you're six months sober, and you're still living in an abandoned car, and you can't hold a job as a dishwasher, and you don't know where to turn, and you're half crazed, and nobody seems to care, it doesn't indicate that AA is working. And I decided to throw myself in the ocean, because I always liked Frederick March walking off in the ocean in The Star is Born. So I walked. I didn't know how to get to the ocean directly from the Gaiety, so I walked back to La Cienega and over to Wilshire and turned right. I knew how to get out that way, and I walked and walked, and I couldn't find the ocean. And I finally stopped at a gas station. Pardon me, buddy. Uh, where's the ocean? He said, you're just in the western end of Beverly Hills, kid. You got to go out past the Veterans Hospital. There wasn't any San Diego freeway then. Out past the Veterans Hospital, then through Santa Monica. It's about another eight miles. <laughs> I don't mind dying, but I'm not going to walk myself to that. <laughs> so I was so desperate, I called up my sponsor. I hate to tell him bad news because he was so intolerant, but I thought what I'd do. Just once, I would tell them the saddest story I could think of and see if I couldn't break through that veneer of his. There must be some humanity inside of him somewhere. I go up and say, Hello? I said, this is Clancy, Bob. So why don't you work? I said, let me tell you something, Bob. <laughs> let me tell you something, Bob. You know, I've told you before, I've lost my wife and my children, the only things that are ever dear to me. That's the position to take on the road. <laughs> I've, my parents have nothing to do with me. You know that. You know I can't. My job has been terrible. I, but I'll tell you, Bob, the, reason, the thing I really want to tell you about is even when I do my best, it isn't people don't like me in the meeting. You say I should get familiar with other newcomers. Their sponsors won't let them. <laughs> you know. The only time I see new old-timers, they're pointing at my car and they're, I just, I sit down and have coffee in the club and other people at the table get up. <laughs> it's just so sad, Bob. I have no place to turn and nobody in the world likes me. And it suddenly struck me. This is true. <laughs> I could, 
I was so overcome, I burst into tears. I just... And I said, Bob, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? He says, why don't you write your damn inventory the way I told you? Well, that got my heart started again. And I, I almost, I didn't say I thought. I said, why don't you? I forget what I was going to ask him. It would be fun to watch the old fool try it. I said, but Bob, and you don't understand. In my judgment, that's the last thing in the world I need. I'm already so cursed with memories and what might have been. That's the last. That'll make me crazy, Bob. I, I can't do it. So your judgment. Who cares about your judgment? Your judgment stinks. If I wanted your judgment, I'd rather an abandoned car and put my head in the back window and ask you for it. If I'm living in a big house in Pacific Palisades, who cares how it looks to you, you goop? I was just flabbergasted. I had heard of man's inhumanity to man, but nothing like this. I, if I would have had the money, if I would have had the money, I would have called the World Service Office in New York and just said, just want you to know there's an old timer in California killing newcomers. <laughs> and I'll tell you his name. It's funny how the clock goes around. Now it's something over a quarter of a century since that day. Now when I talk to the World Service Office in New York, I say things like, No, I'm not. <laughs> But that day I took it, the mad made me so crazy, I took an inventory, something I swore I would never do, because when you're intelligent and sensitive and have been in psychoanalysis, to take an inventory to read to someone with no training at all is ridiculous. <laughs> but I did, and it got me through. And later, I think back now, it's just amazing. The only therapy I've had since 1958 is Alcoholics Anonymous. It's steps, it's people, it's group therapeutics, it's things that have forced me out of myself, out of my introspection, out of my self-obsession, most of the time. And yet there's a definite streak still in me of a self-obsessed person that I have to fight on all the time. I think that's what they mean. They say, don't get too hungry or angry or lonely or tired. Not that they're bad things, but that's when the old personality comes back, the old self-obsessed, throwing things out of perspective. Throwing thing. I suppose, I suppose, sometimes that I, I can't believe it. I know that it sounds hokey. That's why I try to be active, because at least I can remind myself to believe it. Because left to my own devices, I'm never grateful much for anything. There's an old truism. Betsy and I were talking about it last night. It's so sad. Most, I, I was sober for years before it finally dawned on me. And it's so thick, because it'll help you with life. And it's just this. Nothing is wonderful after you're used to it. it things don't stay immaturely wonderful. They may get deeper and richer, but I'm looking for wonderful. If they don't stay wonderful, it's hideous. Some of you young folks here today still may be in the stage where your life depends upon her smile. You may have lunch today and your fingers will touch as you reach for the salt shaker and you'll feel a spark. It's hard to believe that in a few years you will find yourself saying, Give me the goddamn salt. <laughs> now, I have always felt that indicated the other party was going to hell. But it doesn't. It indicates that nothing is wonderful after you're used to it. And that's why people like me and perhaps like some of you have a tendency to take this miracle of AA for granted. I talk a miracle, but it's a miracle all the time. 
And I know it is, but I don't feel it sometimes because I take it for granted. I remember uh, some years ago, 1970, I had a great, I had a great chance. I, I uh, was asked to talk on the noon of July 4th at the International Convention in Miami Beach. And was, Bob and I were talking about lunch the other day. The guy that took me my first day meeting, Homer Borum in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, was the first speaker that morning. The last speaker that, that was my current sponsor. And I was the noon speaker on July 4th. And I thought it would be a great ego thing, but it wasn't. It was a humbling thing. I thought, I'm, I really feel accepted by AA. And I, up till that time, I had been an old-fashioned guy. I wouldn't even hold hands to say the Lord's Prayer. That had come in in the 60s. And I, my sponsor didn't hold hands, and I'm not going to hold hands. You want to be a goof? Hold hands. Wear a dress, too, while you're at it. <laughs> but I was so moved, I thought... This is ridiculous. And starting then, I held hands. I did everything, you know. But when I came back on the plane, I thought, I was working in an advertising agency downtown, doing public relations with an oil company. Not a big oil company. Medium-sized oil company. Honest oil company. Run by Americans, not Dutch. But anyway. And I thought, it's going to be wonderful. I'm going to go to work tomorrow. And I've... They probably have never seen me with a feeling of peace like this. And my eyes are going to spell out love and understanding for the first time. I don't have to be controversial. I won't have to worry about my babies coming to me and saying, They all hate you. Learn to live with it, kid I have. No more of that. It's all going to be together down the highway of life. And I got on the freeway in the morning in Santa Monica. I was starting downtown. Had my rear view mirror set so I could see the road, but also a little of me. <laughs> I knew what they meant. The spiritual experience had flowered. No more controversy, no more anything. I went under the San Diego freeway, and a little old lady in a Toyota came off on the on-ramp. <clears throat> Almost killed me. Missed me by that far. The new spiritual leader of the western states without even blinking an eye had his window down saying you crazy bitch in the fire what the hell's wrong with you I chased her past Lofty and there's a dare and down around Hoover it suddenly struck me no so I released her Instead of going, chasing her to Covina, I got off at my off-ramp. <laughs> and I said, God bless you, ma'am, wherever you are. But my heart was going, get that bitch, get that bitch. <laughs> and it came, I came to realize, maybe I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> and this morning as I was lying in bed looking at the ceiling... I was thinking, I'm not quite there yet. I sometimes am there, but I must never allow myself to think I'm going to stay there because I was there once. It's a continual reinforcing policy. The biggest problem today, Ellen, before I close, the biggest problem today, I noticed the speaker last night said that and then went on for 40 minutes, so I guess I got plenty of time. <laughs> before I close, what are the... I've talked to some of you people about this, but I'll talk to the rest of you about it. One of the great controversies today are treatment centers. And we pretend, we like to pretend they don't exist, and some people love them, some people hate them. The people in my era, who got sober in the 1950s, traditionally don't like treatment centers. There weren't treatment centers. There's only one, the only place I ever heard of in the valley was Shire's Dryer. <laughs> oh, how bad's it been? Well, I've been to Shire's Dryer. <laughs> Well, I guess there's no hope for you. <laughs> and uh, to go to the VA, that's about all. Now, it's just a lot of treatment centers. There's a, I was, as I said, last year in Minneapolis, there were 3,500 people at that meeting, and they were clustered by the treatment centers they came out of. It looked like, a, looked like a, an Olympic, you know. I'm from St. Mary's. <laughs> Nobody cares. But anyway, and sometimes, yeah, I was taught by my betters 
to come to believe that treatment centers are crappy. Easier, softer ways for wealthy pukes. <laughs> now, over the years, I have come to modify that. I have come to really respect some treatment centers. I also think there are treatment centers that are literally killing people. There are good treatment centers and bad treatment centers, and they're hard to tell. There's a best way I've ever been able to describe it. And you wonder, why would people go to treatment centers when AA is available, and it's here, and it's free, and people love you? And the best analogy I've ever been able to think of is like going down, if we went down to the beach on Santa Monica and wanted to go to Catalina, just over the horizon. And here's a lovely little boat with a little roof and a little galley, people in clean white jackets saying, do you want to go to Catalina on the SS Treatment Center? It's a wonderful thing, and you love it. And further down the beach are two guys skulking around. You want to you wanna go over there in an invisible boat called AA? <laughs> Nobody in their right mind is going to write an invisible boat called AA. But here's a skiff going there. So you get on. And you ride out, and it's great. They treat you well. The only problem is, you get just out of sight of shore, and they say, well, we have to go back now. But I'm not there yet. Well, just swim like a thumb bitch. <laughs> and they really mean well. And you might swim, and almost drown. And here come two pukes in an invisible boat. Hey, you want to ride, buddy? I'm not that sick. <laughs> and you swim some more, and here he comes again. You want, you want to ride, buddy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you get in the boat and you realize, this is ridiculous. There's no boat here. <laughs> what do you want me to do, you guys? Grab an oar, grow like hell. <laughs> I'm not that sick. Finally, you're dying, and they pull you out again. Go. <laughs> what do I do? Better grab an oar, buddy. <laughs> oh, you crazy bastards. <laughs> yes. Now. The amazing thing is, as you roll, the boat appears. But it doesn't appear until you begin to row. So you've got to be half crazy to start rowing in the first place. <laughs> and what these oars are, are the actions involvements, I believe, in AA. And the funny thing is, as you row long enough, the boat gets bigger and better. And pretty soon that skiff back there looks like nothing. You can't imagine why people on the beach would want to take a crappy skiff like that. And you don't even care if you want to get to Catalina. I'm fine. <laughs> Let's go down on D deck. <laughs> and there's only one thing wrong. When you start rowing, the boat gradually begins to disappear again. And sometimes you can get right back to a rowboat. And some people say, hey, that isn't the reason. I had it all together. It must be something wrong with this boat. And one day they're back in the water. And other people are on that boat. Some people get it down to just so their feet are dry before they grab the oar. <laughs> Must be some mistake. That's what sponsors are for. They come by and say, Hey, you've got your oar upside down. Oh. <laughs> now, what is the difference between a good treatment center and a bad treatment center? I think the difference is this, and there's examples of both within five miles of us. Bad treatment centers lead people to believe that if they take that skiff and ride out, they will be able to swim from there. They literally kill people. Good treatment centers do the same thing except for one thing. They say, we're turning back now, but I'll tell you what you do. 
look out for two idiots in an invisible boat. <laughs> and jump in. That doesn't mean swim back to us for aftercare. That means get in that boat and roll like a thumbbitch. And those people are turning out what winners there are left to turn out. If being sober and knowing what was wrong was the answer, detoxes would turn out winners. Hospitals would turn out winners. Treatment centers would turn out winners. And they don't. They will take you as long as your insurance is good, folks. I got a guy coming in Monday. I'm out of insurance. The counselor at the hospital said I better talk to you. I was so sick with pleasure. <laughs> Do you have any cash left? <laughs> Just to cover expenses for the gas, you know. <laughs> but he's drowning. Okay, get in the boat, goof. But that's what AA is about. That's what we're here for. We reinforce one another. Because after a while, rowing seems so tedious. And it's, can't call that normal living to row and teach other people to row. When do I get to go ashore and have a little fun? And that's what we got to, that's what we have to remember. Once in a while, something will happen that will help us remember that this truly is wonderful. But the feeling won't stay because we are human beings. We are trapped in the paradox of a body that takes things for granted and a mind who says, yes, but what's in it for me sometimes? And bodies that get tired and cross and out of sorts and petty and get mad at AA once in a while and get mad at your sponsor once in a while and get mad at your babies once in a while and get tired of all this crap and just wonder, when do I get mine? <laughs> I'll tell you. And then you go to AA and sometimes people act funny there. I heard a guy say one time, one of the great lines of all time, he's sitting in a meeting and he thought, talked something about how he thought alcoholics should return to social drinking under the right conditions. And everybody jumped on him, the whole rest of the meeting. What's wrong with you? Tell me something in the report. Come on, come on, come And he said later, God, if a guy can stay sober in AA, you can stay sober anywhere. <laughs> right. But that's why we gather together at these conventions. But this is not really AA. This convention's a big, ornate pit stop. Might get some tires and gas, but that's all. AA is out there, where you must deal with that fallible, weak thing called yourself. And you try to superimpose principles that will enable you to maintain the knowledge that it might not be wonderful, but it is best you've had it. You are now, hopefully, going to grow up and understand the message of deep satisfactions, but since we have a vein of childishness, we forget that. So we have to gather together again and again and again to share our experience, strength, and hope with each other that we may solve our common problem, sobriety, and help other alcoholics to achieve it. I am very pleased to be here this morning, safe and sane and sober. I'm glad that many of my friends are here. I'm glad my wife's here. I'm glad my Sybil C., the oldest, has the most sobriety of any woman in the world, it still sits in these meetings, and I'm so pleased to see her, and a great many people, and Bob P. and Betsy from New York, all my many people I know and respect and admire. And to the newcomer in the back, I want to tell you something. They say you are the most important person in the room. I have some news for you. You are the second most important person. <laughs> Because if I'm not in these rooms, it ain't going to make any difference who is. My boat's going down. I'm glad we're here together. I'm glad that I've, through AA I've come to believe in a God that I can talk to and talk to this morning before I came down here. A God that I used to be afraid of. I'm glad that I have had a sponsor. I'm glad that I've had the reassurance. My children back and they're all grown up and providing me with grandchildren. I'm glad everything is fine. But the most important single thing that I think I could ever be grateful for that somehow here, my desperation and kind men taught me to row and keep rowing till a boat that I could live in appeared. I thank you. I thank God. I thank AA. God bless you.